Scientific management, also called Taylorism, is a theory of management that analyzes and synthesizes workflows. Its main objective is improving economic efficiency, especially labor productivity. It was one of the earliest attempts to apply science to the engineering of processes and to management. Its development began with Frederick Winslow Taylor in the 1880s and 1890s within the manufacturing industries. Its peak of influence came in the 1910s. By the 1920s, it was still influential but had begun an era of competition and syncretism with opposing or complementary ideas. Although scientific management as a distinct theory or school of thought was obsolete by the 1930s, most of its themes are still important parts of industrial engineering and management today. These include analysis, synthesis, logic, rationality, empiricism, work ethic, efficiency and elimination of waste, standardization of best practices. Disdain for tradition preserved merely for its own sake or to protect the social status of particular workers with particular skill sets. The transformation of craft production into mass production. And knowledge transferred between workers and from workers into tools, processes, and documentation. Larger theme of economic efficiency, scientific management's application was contingent on a high level of managerial control over employee work practices. This necessitated a higher ratio of managerial workers to laborers than previous management methods. The great difficulty in accurately differentiating any such intelligent, detail-oriented management from mere misguided micromanagement also caused interpersonal friction between workers and managers. While the terms scientific management, and Taylorism are often treated as synonymous, an alternative view considers Taylorism as the first form of scientific management which was followed by new iterations. Thus in today's management theory, Taylorism is sometimes called the classical perspective. Taylor's own early names for his approach included shop management, and process management. When Louis Brandeis popularized the term scientific management in 1910, Taylor recognized it as another good name for the concept, and he used it himself in his 1911 monograph. A field comprised the work of Taylor his disciples, other engineers and managers, and other theorists, such as Max Weber. It is compared and contrasted with other efforts, including those of Henri Fayel and those of Frank Gilbreth, Sr. and Lillian Mollo Gilbreth. Taylorism proper, in its strict sense, became obsolete by the 1930s, and by the 1960s the term scientific management had fallen out of favor for describing current management theories. However, many aspects of scientific management have never stopped being part of later management efforts called by other names. There is no simple dividing line demarcating the time when management as a modern profession diverged from Taylorism proper. It was a gradual process that began as soon as Taylor published, and each subsequent decade brought further evolution. Scientific management is a variation on the theme of economic efficiency. It is a late 19th and early 20th century instance of the larger recurring theme in human life of increasing efficiency, decreasing waste, and using empirical methods to decide what matters, rather than uncritically accepting pre-existing ideas of what matters. Thus it is a chapter in a larger narrative that includes many ideas, from the folk wisdom of thrift to a profusion of applied science successes, including time and motion study, the efficiency movement, Fordism, operations management, operations research, industrial engineering, manufacturing engineering, logistics, business process management, business process re-engineering, lean manufacturing, and Six Sigma. There is a fluid continuum linking scientific management by that name with the later fields, and there is often no mutual exclusiveness when discussing the details of any one of these topics. In management literature today, the greatest use of the term scientific management is with reference to the work of Taylor and his disciples in contrast to newer, improved iterations of efficiency-seeking methods. In political and sociological terms, Taylorism can be seen as the division of labor pushed to its logical extreme, with a consequent disskilling of the worker and dehumanization of the workers in the workplace. Taylorism is often mentioned along with Fordism because it was closely associated with mass production methods in factories, 
which was its earliest application. Today, task-oriented optimization of work tasks is nearly ubiquitous in industry. Soldiering, Taylor observed that some workers were more talented than others, and that even smart ones were often unmotivated. He observed that most workers who are forced to perform repetitive tasks tend to work at the slowest rate that goes unpunished. This slow rate of work has been observed in many industries in many countries and has been called by various terms, including soldering dogging it, gold bricking, hanging it out, and car canny. Managers may call it by those names or loafing, or malingering. Workers may call it getting through the day, or preventing management from abusing us. Taylor used the term soldiering, and observed that, when paid the same amount, workers will tend to do the amount of work that the slowest among them does. This reflects the idea that workers have a vested interest in their own well-being, and do not benefit from working above the defined rate of work when it will not increase their remuneration. He therefore proposed that the work practice that had been developed in most work environments was crafted, intentionally or unintentionally, to be very inefficient in its execution. He posited that time and motion studies combined with rational analysis and synthesis could uncover one best method for performing any particular task, and that prevailing methods were seldom equal to these best methods. Crucially, Taylor himself prominently acknowledged that if each employee's compensation was linked to their output, their productivity would go up. Thus his compensation plans usually included piece rates. He rejected the notion, which was universal in his day and still held today, that the trades, including manufacturing, were resistant to analysis and could only be performed by craft production methods. In the course of his empirical studies, Taylor examined various kinds of manual labor. For example, most bulk materials handling was manual at the time. Material handling equipment as we know it today was mostly not developed yet. He looked at shoveling and the unloading of railroad cars full of ore, lifting and carrying and the moving of iron pigs at steel mills, the manual inspection of bearing balls, and others. He discovered many concepts that were not widely accepted at the time. For example, by observing workers, he decided that labor should include rest breaks so that the worker has time to recover from fatigue either physical or mental. Workers were taught to take more rests during work, and as a result production paradoxically increased. Unless people manage themselves, somebody has to take care of administration, and thus there is a division of work between workers and administrators. One of the tasks of administration is to select the right person for the right job. The labor should include rest breaks so that the worker has time to recover from fatigue. Now one of the very first requirements for a man who is fit to handle pig iron as a regular occupation is that he shall be so stupid and so phlegmatic that he more nearly resembles in his mental makeup the ox than any other type. The man who is mentally alert and intelligent is for this very reason entirely unsuited to what would, for him, be the grinding monotony of work of this character. Therefore the workman who is best suited to handling pig iron is unable to understand the real science of doing this class of work. Relationship to mechanization and automation, scientific management evolved in an era when mechanization and automation existed but had hardly gotten started, historically speaking, and was still embryonic. Two important corollaries flow from this fact. The ideas and methods of scientific management were exactly what was needed to be added to the American system of manufacturing to extend the transformation from craft work to mechanization and automation. But also, Taylor himself could not have known this, and his goals did not include the extensive removal of humans from the production process. During his lifetime, the very idea would have seemed like science fiction, because not only did the technological bridge to such a world not yet look plausible, but most people had not even considered that it could happen. Before digital computers existed, such ideas were not just outlandish but also mostly unheard of. Nevertheless, Taylor was laying the groundwork for automation and offshoring, because he was analyzing processes into discrete, unambiguous pieces, which is exactly what computers and unskilled people need to follow algorithms designed by others and to make valid decisions within their execution. It is often said that computers are smart in terms of mathematic computation ability, but dumb, 
because they must be told exactly what to calculate, when, and how, and they can never understand why. With historical hindsight it is possible to see that Taylor was essentially inventing something like the highest level computer programming for industrial process control and numerical control in the absence of any machines that could carry it out. But Taylor could not see it that way at the time. In his world, it was humans that would be the agents to execute the program. However, one of the common threads between his world and us is that the agents of execution need not be smart to execute their tasks. In the case of computers, they are not able to be smart. In the case of human workers under scientific management, they were often able but were not allowed. Once the time and motion men had completed their studies of a particular task, the workers had very little opportunity for further thinking, experimenting, or suggestion making. They were expected to play dumb most of the time. In between craft production and full automation lies a natural middle ground of an engineered system of extensive mechanization and partial automation mixed with semi-skilled and unskilled workers in carefully designed algorithmic workflows. Building and improving such systems requires knowledge transfer, which may seem simple on the surface but requires substantial engineering to succeed. Although Taylor's original inspiration for scientific management was simply to replace inferior work methods with smarter ones, the same process engineering that he pioneered also tends to build the skill into the equipment and processes, removing most need for skill in the workers. This engineering was the essence not only of scientific management but also of most industrial engineering since then. It is also the essence of offshoring. The common theme in all these cases is that businesses engineer their way out of their need for large concentrations of skilled workers, and the high-wage environments that sustain them. Effects on labor relations in market economies, Taylor's view of workers, Taylor's view of workers was complex, having both insightful and obtuse elements. Taylorism took some steps toward addressing their needs, but Taylor nevertheless had a condescending view of less intelligent workers whom he sometimes compared to draft animals. And perhaps Taylor was so immersed in the vast work immediately in front of him that he failed to strategize about the next steps. Many other thinkers soon stepped forward to offer better ideas on the roles that humans would play in mature industrial systems. James Hartness, a fellow ASME member, published The Human Factor in Works Management in 1912. Frank Gilbreth and Lillian Mollo Gilbreth offered alternatives to Taylorism. The Human Relations School of Management evolved in the 1930s. Some scholars, such as Harry Braverman, insisted that human relations did not replace Taylorism but rather that both approaches were complementary Euro Taylorism determining the actual organization of the work process, and human relations helping to adapt the workers to the new procedures. Today's efficiency seeking methods such as lean manufacturing, include respect for workers and fulfillment of their needs as inherent parts of the theory. Clearly a syncretism has occurred since Taylor's day, although its implementation has been uneven, as lean management in capable hands has produced good results for both managers and workers, but in incompetent hands has damaged enterprises. Implementations of scientific management usually fail to account for several inherent challenges, individuals are different from each other. The most efficient way of working for one person may be inefficient for another. The economic interests of workers and management are rarely identical, so that both the measurement processes and the retraining required by Taylor's methods are frequently resented and sometimes sabotaged by the workforce. Taylor himself, in fact, recognized these challenges and had some good ideas for meeting them. Nevertheless, his own implementations of his system were never really very successful. Citation needed they plugged along rockily and eventually were overturned, usually after Taylor had left. And countless managers who later raped or worshipped Taylor did even worse jobs of implementation. Typically they were less analytically talented managers who had latched onto scientific management as the latest fad for cutting the unit cost of production. Like bad managers even today, these were the people who used the big words without any deep understanding of what they meant. Taylor knew that scientific management could not work unless the workers benefited from the profit increases that it generated. Taylor had developed a method for generating the increases, for the dual purposes of owner-manager profit and worker profit, 
realizing that the methods relied on both of those results in order to work correctly. But many owners and managers seized upon the methods thinking that the profits could be reserved solely or mostly for themselves and the system could endure indefinitely merely through force of authority. Workers are necessarily human, they have personal needs and interpersonal friction, and they face very real difficulties introduced when jobs become so efficient that they have no time to relax, and so rigid that they have no permission to innovate. Early decades, making jobs unpleasant, under Taylorism, workers' work effort increased in intensity. Workers became dissatisfied with the work environment and became angry. During one of Taylor's own implementations, a strike at the Watertown Arsenal led to an investigation of Taylor's methods by a U.S. House of Representatives committee, which reported in 1912. The conclusion was that scientific management did provide some useful techniques and offered valuable organizational suggestions, but it gave production managers a dangerously high level of uncontrolled power. After an attitude survey of the workers revealed a high level of resentment and hostility towards scientific management, the Senate banned Taylor's methods at the arsenal. Taylorism lowered worker morale and exacerbated existing conflicts between labor and management. As a consequence, it inadvertently strengthened labor unions and their bargaining power in labor disputes, thereby neutralizing most or all of the benefit of any productivity gains that Taylorism had achieved. Thus its net benefit to owners and management ended up being small or negative. It would take new efforts, borrowing some ideas from Taylorism but mixing them with others, to produce more successful formulas. Later decades, making jobs disappear, to whatever extent scientific management caused the strengthening of labor unions by giving workers more to complain about than bad or greedy managers already gave them, it also led to other pressures tending toward worker unhappiness, the erosion of employment in developed economies via both offshoring and automation. Both were made possible by the de-skilling of jobs, which was made possible by the knowledge transfer that scientific management achieved. Knowledge was transferred both to cheaper workers and from workers into tools. Jobs that once would have required craft work first transformed to semi-skilled work, then unskilled. At this point the labor had been commoditized, and thus the competition between workers moved closer to pure than it had been, depressing wages and job security. Jobs could be offshored or they could be rendered non-existent through automation. Either way, the net result from the perspective of developed economy workers was that jobs started to pay less, then disappear. The power of labor unions in the mid-20th century only led to a push on the part of management to accelerate the process of automation, hastening the onset of the later stages just described. A central assumption of Taylorism was that the worker was taken for granted as a cog in the machinery. The chain of connections between his work and automation is visible in historical hindsight, which sees that Taylorism made jobs unpleasant, and its logical successors then made them less remunerative and less secure. Then scarcer. And finally non-existent. Successes such as corporate re-engineering or business process re-engineering brought into sight the distant goal of the eventual elimination of industry's need for unskilled, and later, perhaps even most skilled human workers in any form, all stemming from the roots laid by Taylorism's recipe for deconstructing a process. As the resultant commodification of work advances, no skilled profession, even medicine, has proven to be immune from the efforts of Taylorism's successes, the re-engineers, whose mandate often comes from skewed motives among people referred to as bean counters and PHBS. Effects on disruptive innovation one of the traits of the era of applied science is that technology continually evolves. There is always a balance to be struck between scientific management's goal of formalizing the details of a process and the risk of fossilizing one moment's technological state into cultural inertia that stifles disruptive innovation. To give one example, would John Parsons have been able to incubate the earliest development of numerical control if he were a worker in a red tape laden organization being told from above that the best way to mill a part had already been perfected, and therefore he had no business experimenting with his own preferred methods? Implementations of scientific management worked within the implicit context of a particular technological moment and thus did not account for the possibility of putting the continuous in continuous improvement process. The notion of a one best way failed to add the coda, 
a euro within the context of our current environment. It treated the context as constant rather than as variable. Later methods such as lean manufacturing corrected this oversight by including ongoing innovation as part of their process and by recognizing the iterative nature of development. Relationship to Fordism it is quite natural to jump to the post hoc conclusion that Fordism borrowed ideas from Taylorism and expanded from there. In fact it appears that Taylor himself did that when he visited the Ford Motor Company's Michigan plants not too long before he died. But it seems that the methods at Ford were in fact independently reinvented based on logic, and that any influence from Taylorism either was nil or at least was far enough removed to be very indirect. Charles E. Sorensen disclaimed any connection at all. There was a climate at Ford at the time that the world's experts were worthless, because if Ford had listened to them, its great successes would not exist. Henry Ford felt that he had succeeded in spite of, not because of, experts, who had tried to stop him in various ways. Therefore Sorensen spoke very dismissively of Taylor, and the mention was only to lump him into the unneeded so-called expert category. Sorensen did speak very highly of Walter Flanders and credits him with being the first driving force behind the efficient floor plan layout at Ford. Sorensen says that Flanders knew absolutely nothing about Taylor. It is possible that Flanders had been exposed to the spirit of Taylorism elsewhere, although not to its name, and had been influenced by it, but he did not cite it explicitly as he simply allowed logic to guide his production development. Regardless, the Ford team apparently did independently invent modern mass production techniques in the period of 1905 to 1915, and they themselves were not aware of any borrowing from Taylorism. Perhaps it is only possible with hindsight to see the overall cultural zeitgeist that connected the budding Fordism to the rest of the efficiency movement during the decade of 1905 to 1915. This is not unlike other invention storylines where it was more than just what who was working toward a practical steam engine. More than just Fulton who was working on steam boats. More than just Edison who was working on electrical technology. And even regarding Henry Ford himself, more than just he who was working toward a truly practical automobile in the 1890s. The same can be said about the development of the engineering of processes between the 1890s and the 1920s, although the Ford team were not at all conscious of this at the time. They perceived themselves to be working in a vacuum in that respect, but historians can argue with them about the extent to which that was really true. Taylor was an early pioneer in the field of process analysis and syntheses. But he did not have the field to himself for long. The world was ready for such development by the late 19th and early 20th centuries. And in fact many people started to work on it, sometimes independently, sometimes with direct or indirect influence on each other. One of the hardest to damn myths about the evolution of mass production at Ford is one which credits much of the accomplishment to scientific management. No one at Ford a year or not Mr. Ford, Cousins, Flanders, Wills, Pete Martin, nor a Euro was acquainted with the theories of the father of scientific management, Frederick W. Taylor. Years later I ran across a quotation from a two-volume book about Taylor by Frank Barclay Copley, who reports a visit Taylor made to Detroit late in 1914, nearly a year after the moving assembly line had been installed at our Highland Park plant. Taylor expressed surprise to find that Detroit industrialists had undertaken to install the principles of scientific management without the aid of experts. To my mind this unconscious admission by an expert is expert testimony on the futility of too great reliance on experts and should forever dispose of the legend that Taylor's ideas had any influence at Ford. Influence on planned economies, scientific management was naturally appealing to managers of planned economies, because central economic planning relies on the idea that the expenses that go into economic production can be precisely predicted and can be optimized by design. The opposite theoretical pole would be laissez-faire thinking in which the invisible hand of free markets is the only possible designer. In reality most economies today are somewhere in between. Soviet Union In the Soviet Union, Taylorism was advocated by Alexei Gastev and Norchner Organizatia Truda. It found support in both Vladimir Lenin and Leon Trotsky. Gastev continued to promote this system of labor management until his arrest and execution in 1939. 
Historian Thomas P. Hughes has detailed the way in which the Soviet Union in the 1920s and 1930s enthusiastically embraced Fordism and Taylorism, importing American experts in both fields as well as American engineering firms to build parts of its new industrial infrastructure. The concepts of the five-year plan and the centrally planned economy can be traced directly to the influence of Taylorism on Soviet thinking. Hughes quotes Joseph Stalin. American efficiency is that indomitable force which neither knows nor recognizes obstacles, which continues on a task once started until it is finished, even if it is a minor task, and without which serious constructive work is impossible. The combination of the Russian revolutionary sweep with American efficiency is the essence of Leninism. Hughes offers the equation Taylorismus plus Fordismus equals Americanismus to describe the Soviet view. Sorensen recounted his experience as one of the American consultants bringing Ford know-how to the USSR during this brief era, before the Cold War made such exchanges unthinkable. As the Soviet Union developed and grew in power, both sides, the Soviets and the Americans, chose to ignore or deny the contribution that American ideas and expertise had made, the Soviets because they wished to portray themselves as creators of their own destiny and not indebted to a rival and the Americans because they did not wish to acknowledge their part in creating a powerful communist rival. Anti-communism had always enjoyed widespread popularity in America, and anti-capitalism in Russia, but after World War II, he precluded any admission by either side that technologies or ideas might be either freely shared or clandestinely stolen. East Germany the German Federal Archives contain documentation created by the German Democratic Republic as it sought to increase efficiency in its industrial sectors. In the accompanying photograph, workers discuss standards that have recently been created specifying how each task should be done and how long it should take. By the 1950s, Taylor's original form of scientific management had grown dated, but the goals and themes remained attractive and found new avatars. The workers in the photograph were engaged in a state-planned instance of process improvement, but they were essentially pursuing the same goals that were also contemporaneously pursued in the free world by people like the developers of the Toyota production system. Legacy Scientific management was one of the first attempts to systematically treat management and process improvement as a scientific problem. It was probably the first to do so in a bottom-up way, which is a concept that remains useful even today in concert with other concepts. Two corollaries of this primacy are that scientific management became famous and it was merely the first iteration of a long developing way of thinking, and many iterations have come since. Nevertheless, common elements unite them. With the advancement of statistical methods, quality assurance and quality control could begin in the 1920s and 1930s. During the 1940s and 1950s, the body of knowledge for doing scientific management evolved into operations management, operations research, and management cybernetics. In the 1980s total quality management became widely popular, and in the 1990s re-engineering went from a simple word to a mystique. Today's Six Sigma and Lean manufacturing could be seen as new kinds of scientific management, although their evolutionary distance from the original is so great that the comparison might be misleading. In particular, Shigeo Shingo, one of the originators of the Toyota production system, believed that this system and Japanese management culture in general should be seen as a kind of scientific management. Peter Drucker saw Frederick Taylor as the creator of knowledge management, because the aim of scientific management was to produce knowledge about how to improve work processes. Although the typical application of scientific management was manufacturing, Taylor himself advocated scientific management for all sorts of work, including the management of universities and government. For example, Taylor believed scientific management could be extended to the work of our salesmen. Shortly after his death, his acolyte Harlow S. Person began to lecture corporate audiences on the possibility of using Taylorism for sales engineering. This was a watershed insight in the history of corporate marketing. Today's militaries employ all of the major goals and tactics of scientific management, if not under that name. Of the key points, all but wage incentives for increased output are used by modern military organizations. Wage incentives rather appear in the form of skill bonuses for enlistments. 
scientific management has had an important influence in sports, where stopwatches and motion studies rule the day, modern human resources can be seen to have begun in the scientific management era, most notably in the writings of Catherine M. H. Blackford, who was also a proponent of eugenics. See also, digital tailorism, dirty, dangerous and demeaning, Hawthorne effect, management science, modern times, Pandora's box, the pajama game, the secret life of machines series 3, the secret life of the office, stackhanovism, words per minute is a tailorism measurement of office productivity, references. Further reading, Aitken, Hugh G. J., 1960, Scientific Management in Action, Tailorism at Watertown Arsenal, 1908-1915, Princeton, New Jersey, USA, Princeton University Press. ISBN A 978-0-691-04241-1, LCCNA 84026462, OCLCA 1468387. First published in 1960 by Harvard University Press. Republished in 1985 by Princeton University Press, with a new foreword by Merritt Rowe Smith, a Belzinger. Mark R., Scientific Management, Socialist Discipline, and Soviet Power, London, UK, IB Tories and Company Limited, ISBN A 978 1 85043 108 4 Braverman, Harry, 1974, Labour and Monopoly Capital, The Degradation of Work in the Twentieth Century, New York, New York, USA, republication by Monthly Review Press. ISBN A 0 85345 940 1. Dawson. Michael, The Consumer Trap Big Business Marketing in American Life, Urbana, Illinois, USA, University of Illinois Press. ISBN A 0 252 07264 2. Drury, Horace Bookwalter, Scientific Management, A History and Criticism, New York, New York, USA. Columbia University A. Gershon, Richard, Telecommunications Management, Industry Structures and Planning Strategies, Maha, New Jersey, USA, Lawrence Elbaum Associates, ISBN A 978-0-8058-3002-6A, Hartness, James, The Human Factor in Works Management, New York and London, McGraw-Hill, OCLCA. 1,065,709. Republished by Hive Publishing Company as Hive Management History Series No. 46, ISBN 978-0-87960-047-1. Head, Simon, The New Ruthless Economy, Work and Power in the Digital Age, Oxford, UK, Oxford University Press. ISBN A 978-0-19-517983-5. Head analyzes current implementations of Taylorism not only on the assembly line, but also in the offices and in medicine are, Hound Shell, David A., From the American System to Mass Production, 1800-1932, The Development of Manufacturing Technology in the United States, Baltimore, Maryland, Johns Hopkins University Press, ISBN A 978-0-8018-2975-8, LCCNA 83016269R, Hughes, Thomas P. 1989, American Genesis, A Century of Invention and Technological Enthusiasm, 1870 Euro 1970, Chicago, Illinois, USA, University of Chicago Press. ISBN A 978-0-14-009741-2. Canigel, Robert, The One Best Way, Frederick Winslow Taylor and the Enigma of Efficiency, New York, New York, USA, Penguin Viking, ISBN A 978-0-670-86402-7. A detailed biography of Taylor and a historian's look at his ideas a Mitchum. Carl, Management, Encyclopedia of Science, Technology, and Ethics 3, Macmillan Reference USA, 
ISBN A 978-0-02-865834-6A, Morph, Martin 8 Scenarios for Work in the Future in Futurist, V17 N3 PPA 24 Euro June 29, 1983, reprinted in Cornish, Edward and World Future Society Habitats Tomorrow, Homes and Communities in an Exciting New Era Selections from the Futurist, PPA. 14 a Euro 19, Mullins, Laurie J., Management and Organizational Behavior, Financial to Mesa Euro FT Press a Euro Prentice Hall a Euro Pearson Education Limited, ISBN A 978-0-273-68876-1A, Noble, David F., Forces of Production, A Social History of Industrial Automation, New York, New York, USA, Not. ISBN A 978-0-394-51262-4, LCCNA 83048867A, Rosen, Ellen. Improving Public Sector Productivity, Concepts and Practice, Thousand Oaks, California, USA, Sage Publications, ISBN A 978-0-8039. 4573-9A, Yeba, Lucas, Next Taylorsim, A Calculus of Knowledge Work, Frankfurt am Main, BRD, Peter Lang, ISBN A 978-3631624050, Sorensen, Charles E. With Williamson, Samuel T., My Forty Years with Ford, New York, New York, USA, Norton, LCCNA 56,010,854A. Various republications, including ISBN 9780814332795. Stalin, J.V., Problems of Leninism, Lectures Delivered at the Svidlov University, Beijing, China, Foreign Languages Presser, Taylor, Frederick Winslow, Shop Management, New York, New York. USA, American Society of Mechanical Engineers, OCLCA 2,365,572. Shop management began as an address by Taylor to a meeting of the ASME, which published it in pamphlet form. The link here takes the reader to a 1912 republication by Harper and Brothers. Also available from Project Gutenberg are, Taylor, Frederick Winslow, The Principles of Scientific Management, New York, New York, USA and London, UK, Harper and Brothers, LCCNA 11,010,339, OCLCA 233,134. Also available from Project Gutenberg are, external links, special collections, F.W. Taylor Collection. Stevens Institute of Technology has an extensive collection at its library.